Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Sotheby's. My name is Emily Bierman, and I am joined by my fabulous colleague, Amy Flieger. We are pleased to welcome you for what promises to be a fascinating conversation about the most exciting and comprehensive collection of photographs by the legendary Ansel Adams that has ever come to market. On Monday, December 14th, the sale of A Grand Vision, the David H. Arrington collection of Ansel Adams masterworks will go under the hammer. So today, we're lucky to be joined by the man behind the collection, David Arrington, and by a true Adams scholar, Andrea Stillman. David Arrington developed a deep interest in photography as a teenager when he began taking pictures and studying the work of Ansel Adams to improve his technique and skills. In his late 20s, David started collecting Adams, a pursuit which over the decades gave rise to one of the largest and most important privately held collections of work by the photographer. Highlights from the collection have been exhibited widely, most recently in Ansel Adams' Eloquent Light at the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art. A proud native Texan, David and his beautiful wife, Shelley, reside in Midland, Texas. Andrea Stillman worked closely with Ansel Adams as his executive assistant for seven years in the 1970s. Subsequent to Adams' death in 1984, Andrea has edited and authored innumerable books on the photographer, including Ansel Adams' Letters and Images, 1916 to 1984, Ansel Adams, Our National Parks, Yosemite Ansel Adams, Ansel Adams, California, Ansel Adams in Color, The Bible, Ansel Adams, 400 Photographs, and my new personal favorite, Looking at Ansel Adams, the Photographs and the Man. So today, we will talk for about 45 minutes, and then we'll answer some of your questions. This is a live event and fully interactive. You may submit questions at any time, starting now. Underneath your video screen, you will see a web form where you can enter your name and a question. We look forward to engaging with you and answering your questions a little later. So without a, any further ado, uh, we'll start this conversation. Uh, so Andrea and David, um, in different ways, Adams had a defining and lasting impact on your lives. David as a committed collector of Ansel's photographs, and Andrea, you as a staunch advocate for the photographer's legacy. I'm curious, what initially drew you to Ansel's work, um, and how did it become a major part of your life? Andrea? The first time I met Ansel, I was working at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the Department of Prints and Photographs, although photographs were not included in the title yet, it was a Department of Prints, photographs didn't count, so they were kind of, you know, in the in the back corner. And and um, David McAlpin called up the curator and said, I want my friend Ansel Adams to have a show, and I'm willing to pay for it. Uh, he should have a one-man show, and so it was decided that, that we would have a show in 1974, and Ansel came to meet us, the curator and me, and um, the, so we're waiting, and it's, it's pretty stuffy at the Metropolitan Museum. Everybody's kind of old and gray, and they're, they've all practically got eye shades on, and it, it, it's kind of dark, and, and suddenly the door swung open, and in walked what seemed like a peak from the, the Sierra Nevada. It, he, he had his Stetson, his gray Stetson on, and he wore a bolo tie like David's wearing, and not a regular a foreign hand tie. And, and he has this big smile and this kind of white snowy beard. So it's kind of a combination between a, a Sierra a Granite Peak and, and, and Santa Claus. And, and, and he had this big smile, hi, how are you? And you're kind of swept off your feet by this, this, this man, this, this larger than life and obviously this huge heart and this big personality. And this uh, just glorious posit positivity, and and you thought, oh, I really want to be around that, and and then, uh, so so that that began it for me, and then I worked with him on the show, and then finally the show opened, and you got to see all the photographs. So, it was it it, it, it transformed my life. Not only did I discover Ansel's photography, but I discovered the environment and the national parks, which I hadn't known anything about before. 
So it transformed my life. And David, how did it uh, how did it impact and transform your life? Well, um, I was a photographer at the age of like 15 and all serious photographers end up finding their way to Ansel Adams. And he writes extensively about it. Uh, you're drawn to not only his pictures, but to the uh, grandeur of what he's doing of the technical end of it. So it definitely changed the way that that I, I grew as a photographer and, and then later on as a collector. So this is a question for David. In building your collection, you had the good fortune to meet several important people with direct connections to Ansel. And one of those people is sitting here with us today. So we're wondering how you originally met Andrea. Well, Andrea and I met uh, through my curator, Andrew Smith out of Santa Fe, New Mexico. And we began a, a wonderful relationship um, about, and we would mainly talk about Ansel. And uh, for years, we would spend uh, Thanksgiving in New York. And, and Andrea lives in New York a, at the time. And, and so on Wednesdays before um, Thanksgiving, we would always meet in person and she would have me to her home and, and fix me breakfast. And we would we pull pictures out and books out, and we'd talk about uh, Ansel. Usually, our breakfasts last lasted past noon, but but we just had a delight a delightful time every um, uh, Thanksgiving Eve. And then we would also talk talk uh, at, at other times about the the photographs and just different different things that were on our mind. And I always learned a new a new fact or a factoid about Ansel or, or many um, uh, from Andrea every time we visited. So, so we, we, we've had a delightful relationship. So Andrea, you mentioned uh, that Ansel just sort of swept into your life when you were working at the Met. Um, how did you end up finding yourself actually working for Ansel and what was he like as, as a boss? I found myself working for Ansel because I was standing on the corner of 57th Street and 3rd Avenue in New York, and Ansel's business manager said, we were there, his show, we were planning his show, it hadn't happened yet, and, and, um, uh, and he said, I have a terrible headache, and I said, I'm so sorry, what, what's wrong? He said, well, listen to the noise, and I said, the noise, what noise? I couldn't hear the trucks and, and the cars and the buses racing by because I was living in New York and I just didn't, didn't observe the natural scene. And right then I thought, I got to get out of this place. And then after, after Ansel's show opened, he offered me a job and said, move to Carmelo and work for me. And I thought, well, wait a second. I spent all my life in New York and I really like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but gee, I think I'll go for this because what an offer. And then I, he, I, he took me to Yosemite and I said, and between living in Carmel and summers in Yosemite, who could pass this up? So I jumped at the chance. And I, in four weeks, I, I was in, living in California. So that's how it happened. So the pictures that we see on screen right now are these absolutely wonderfully charming images of you and Ansel. And I think uh, the one in the middle, um, that is in New York, right? So that's yeah. you and Ansel walking in New York. That's New York. That now that's I've been working for him for a few years. That must be 1978 or 1979, and we were there probably to print a book at um, Rappaport uh, Printing Press. Um, unfortunately, it was July. It was incredibly hot, and Ansel suffered in the heat, um, so it wasn't the best. He didn't see New York at its best. But then, of course, he hated New York. He he really was just pining for the Sierra the whole time he was there. And on the right is a photograph of me with Ansel by his assistant at the darkroom assistant at the time named Alan Ross and Ansel's kind of hamming it up looking you know uh, flirtatious there but that was just Ansel he, he 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 didn't know how to keep a straight face when the camera was trained on him okay I'm sorry the next question um is for David I'm wondering if you can tell us about the first Ansel Adams photograph that you bought and wondering if you just if you sought it out specifically, or if you had a wish list of images that you knew that you wanted to have. If there was one in particular that really 
drew your interest? Yes. So the the uh, first image I purchased was the monolith, the face of half dome. But but as you're collecting, um, you're you know it it it, it kind of takes on a life of itself. But I'll explain the monolith, the face of half dome. Number one, I was attracted to it because it's a very stunning image. However, once I started reading about it, that uh, Ansel came up with a couple of things: the zone system, and we can talk about that, or or what he called pre-visualization, meaning he saw in his mind's eye the photograph that he was going to take and what it would look like hanging on the wall. And so he he you know developed that uh, uh, sense of artistry. And, and he talks about the monolith, the face of half dome as his first successful attempt at his idea of, of pre-visualization. Well, what that connotes is to me is that he had many unsuccessful attempts at pre-visualization, which was just an idea that he had come up with. So as a photographer, you, you understand that because, because you want to capture an image a certain way or do a certain thing. And, you know, you don't quite, get it right or or get it at all and then you keep working at it and working at it, you finally get it and you're like you you know it's it, it's euphoric because you because you had an idea and you and you worked in, in it and it came to life so as a photographer that really spoke to me and and also you know ergo life so that that is really something that everybody can touch and feel because we all have those same things in our life regardless you know, you know, what hat you wear or, or, or shoes you're in. Everyone has those unsuccessful times. And then when you're successful at something through hard work, it, it's, it's, it's a good feeling. So for all those reasons, kind of balled into one is the monolith, the face half tone. So David, one of the true masterpieces of 20th century art or the full history of art would be Ansel Adams, Moonrise, Hernandez, New Mexico. You've often referred to it as your Mona Lisa. Um, hunting for an early print of Moonrise is like searching for a needle in a haystack, nearly impossible. Uh, can you tell us about your search um, and how did you know that this was so special? Yeah, yeah, this is actually a great story. So, you know, you know, when you're collecting and again, I never viewed myself as a collector. I was just passionately um, acquiring images that I that I liked, that I enjoyed. Um, I enjoyed the collecting as much as I did having them on my wall and, and, and enjoying them. Um, but but of course, you know, Moonrise Hernandez is the most iconic picture in the 20th century. And it's, you know, one that, that Ansel took in 1941 of Moonrise Hernandez. Hernandez is a little town just north of, of Santa Fe. And he writes about it extensively. So um, the, the, you know, the better story is the one that Andrea can tell about how she um, was able to, to, um, to come across this one or find this one. And, and, and you know, it, and it is believed to be the first one ever printed and she she has some anecdotal information on that but it is the mona lisa of photography because it is it, it is arguably the first uh a moonrise ever printed of the most iconic picture of the 20th century so um i was i was introduced well uh, uh, andrew smith had already introduced we already knew each other so andrea is the one that procured it and i think her story about the mona lisa which is the first moonrise ever printed, uh, I believe, um, is is a better story. So, Andrea, I'm going to kick it over to you, and you can uh, tell us a little bit about uh, about this this one specific uh, uh, image. Well, I'd be delighted to. Um, when I was working for Ansel, he always felt that the print he made today was better than the print yesterday. So why? care about what were called at the time vintage prints, but I was interested to, to find a, to see his photographs as a, in a whole, uh, as a whole range, uh, you know, an early monolith and an eight monolith, a late monolith, and you could tr see the differences in, in his printing styles. And so I, at the end of my time working for him about 1978 or 79, I started look, looking for who would have purchased his photographs in the 1940s. And believe me, there were no photography galleries 
So uh, the, he would have had to go to Ansel to buy a picture. And he didn't have a lot of correspondence to go through that, that showed you people uh, asking for photographs. So I, I, um, I, I talked to Virginia, his wife, about who their friends were. And, and, I, and going back to correspondence, I found some names. And one name was um, Levis. And I looked up, I found that um, uh, um, the Levis family was from Northern California, from Santa, Santa Rosa and San Francisco. And I found the name of um, Sidney Levis, and he and his wife had apparently purchased a moonrise from Ansel in 1941 or early 42. And I called up his widow, uh, and she, I said, "Could I come and see your photograph? Do you still have it?" She said, "Yes, I'm looking at it right on my living room wall." And so I drove up to Santa Rosa, and I walked in, and I about fell on the floor because it was smaller than I was used to, and also. Look at all the clouds in the upper left. The, 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 they're not, they don't show in the prints he was making when I was working for him in the 1970s. And to, so that was very unusual. And then I, she took it out of the frame and on the back, it, Ansel had inscribed it to, to, to the two of them. And everything about it, the map board, the photographic paper, the, the ink he was using, um, uh, everything about it told me that it was made very, very close to the date of the negative, which is November 1st, 1941. And I said, whatever you do, this is a very, very special, rare thing. I, I don't know of any others. The earliest prints before that I'd seen were 1943 and 1945. So this is two years earlier and, and substantially different, both in size, it was a slightly smaller than 16 by 20. And ordinarily, uh, a sheet of 16 by 20 paper, Ansel would by the time he trimmed it and cropped it to mount it, it would still be almost 16 by 20. This was a funny size that must have, uh, uh, Ansel's darkroom assistant and I discussed this. What, what was he doing, to, you taking a piece of paper and cutting off a side? This wasn't a standard uh, size. So right from the get-go, you're kind of mystified by that. And then also the map board was a map board that he stopped using in 1942. You never saw it again. And, uh, and this, uh, so you, you knew this was different. And I said, if you take care, special care of this, I don't know if you have children or what you're going to do with this, but this is a, this needs to be in, a, in an important collection someday, preferably museum. I have a museum background, preferably museum. And so uh, just make sure that you're, whoever you d give this to someday, um, uh, I st stays in touch with me because I'd hate to lose track of this. And then um, about uh, 20 years later, uh, her son, Stephen, called me and he said, hi, I'm Stephen Levis and I inherited this moonrise and I understand you're, you are, have a vested, not, you, you're interested in this picture because it's important. I said, well, yes, exactly. I'm so glad you have it. He said, yes, I'm looking at it right now. I, 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 I love it. My wife and I see it every day, several times a day. And we wouldn't part with it for the world. I said, well, great. Well, if you ever decide that you want to do anything with that, I'll find the right home for it. Like Stieglitz. Stieglitz didn't sell photographs. Stieglitz was Ansel's guru. And Alfred Stieglitz, he didn't sell photographs. He placed them. And I figured if Stephen ever had to sell this for any reason, I would help him place it in the right home. And so he remembered that. So he, periodically, I, every two or three years, I'd hear from him. But... Um, at a certain point in uh, 2006, he called me. I picked up the phone, and he had a very remarkable voice. You knew it, even though you only talked to him every two to three years. You knew his voice the minute he was on the phone. And I said, hello. I said, hello. And he said, hi, Andrea. It's and I, and I knew instantly who it was, and I knew why he was calling. He was calling because he had to sell the moonrise for some reason. And I said, Stephen, I'm crying at, you know, um, Essentially, I'm crying for you because I know how much you love this. But if you need to find a home for this, I will find a good home, somebody that cares for it. And he said, fine. And I knew a, a museum was not an option because museums take two to three years to buy anything. And even then, you got to try to whack them over the head to convince them to do it. And so, so I thought of David Arrington, and I called Andy Smith. I said, Andy, do you think David would be interested? This is I've been tracking this photograph for more than 20 years. This is the only one of its kind. It deserves to be in a collection, a museum quality collection. 
And Andy said, absolutely. We'll go for it. Send it out. So I did. And so that's why David has it. And the rest is history, as they say. Um, and there it is. And it really is a, a truly um, just sublimely gorgeous, gorgeous object, um, both in reproduction and in person. We are honored to have it on our walls right now at Sotheby's. David, um, aside from Andrea, another important relationship was the one you formed with Ansel's family. You visited their home in Carmel around 2006, having been collecting Ansel's photographs for a little over a decade. So how did this visit come to be and what was your experience like in meeting the family? Yes, it, it was a great time. So so uh, Michael and, and uh, 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 not uh, uh, Jean. Yeah. Uh, Jean. So, so Michael and Jean live in uh, Virginia in annual in Ansel's home in Carmel. And so, so uh, Andrew Smith lined up a meeting and, uh, and me and my good friend, Dick Nahr from Tyler to Texas uh, headed, headed out there and we spent two days with them looking at, uh, at, at their, their uh, a, a cache of, of Ansel. And, and so, you know, we, we sat there for two days and they were so kind and gracious. Michael would uh, recount um, each photograph, whether he was there. Cause a lot of times like on Moonrise, he was a little boy and he, he remembers things about, you know, the taking of Moonrise from his perspective. Now his dad wrote about it extensively. So, so I sat there for two days and, and I, took, I took copious notes uh, of every picture that we looked at and, and we looked at a couple of hundred and, and so, um, you know, it, it was a two day event, which took forever, um, uh, was enjoyable. I mean, it's a lot of fun. So, um, so we, we, we really had a wonderful time getting to, to know them. They're lovely people. Uh, they open their home and they open their home just hearing stories from, from, from not only Andrea, but, but from everybody else. They open their home all the time to all kinds of people. So but you, you had the opportunity to essentially stand in a, a, a dark room apron in the exact same spot that Ansel stood. Yeah, that's kind of a, a, a famous photograph of Ansel on the right and, and not so famous photograph on the left of me and Derek. But, <laughs> but, but it's on the back of a bunch of his books. And, and so they let me go in his dark room and I, and I saw his, his rubber apron and I mean, just sparks went off in my mind. And I said, Hey, can I have, can I take a picture right where Angel had, had his? And they said, sure. So we went down there and we, we, you know, joked around a little bit right there. I, I think if Angel had, had been there with us, he, he'd have been right in the middle of all of it. So, so, so we had a delightful time. I got to look at the dark room, which was really interesting. He, he has his enlarger on a railroad track in the middle of the dark room. You know, most enlargers are vertical and you shine the light down. His, because he had a moving magnetic wall and, and a moving enlarger. So that was really cool. And like he invented to came up with it himself. He also had other little things. I won't get into all the details that he came up with that were interesting and they used them some of the time and some not. That has to do with the lighting. But, 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 but back to your question. So, so we looked at a lot of pictures and Michael, the ones that, that he was there, he told me about his experience of being there when he took the photograph. I wrote all that down and, and the ones that he wasn't, he still had an impression from what his dad had told him or whatever impression it was that he had. I wrote that down. So, so I kind of could take a, 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 a notes on all it of that. It's very memorable. It sounds like it's quite the experience. Yeah. And yeah. I ended up buying them all. So, like I said, you know, I'm a Texan. We overdo everything. So, um, so that's how that happened. So, Andrea, um, David's just given a very um, colorful explanation of what it was like to be in Ansel's dark room. Uh, I've read that Ansel was very structured with his work day, would happily have worked and printed seven days a week, labored intensely to make those perfect prints. Um, what would you say it was like on an average day in the dark room working with, with Ansel? Ansel started work at eight o'clock. By eight o'clock, he was in the dark room working. So when I arrived at nine, I didn't, I didn't see him because the, you, you couldn't go in the dark room. You'd, you'd, 
you mess everything up. So uh, I'd hear the water running and I'd hear the beeper going beep, 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 that he would use to time his uh, dodging and burning. But he, if he wouldn't emerge until about 9.30 or 10. The door would slide open and he would come out. The picture you just saw where he has his glasses by Arnold Newman, where he has his glasses on his head and he's wearing the rubber apron. He'd issue forth from the darkroom and in his hand he'd have a dripping wet print. And he'd be holding up the print and he would have this big smile on his face. And he'd say, I think I got it. That means he made enough test prints to know that he was ready to, to make however many prints I, I told him he needed to make that day, like 10, 25, whatever it was, that he, he would have to make for orders. Uh, and so he, he was just so thrilled that he'd gotten it. And then he'd take the print and he'd tear it in half and he'd go in the kitchen and he'd dry half in the microwave. I remember the first time he showed me this, I thought, what are we doing in the kitchen? And I said, <laughs> And so what? And he's tearing it in half. What are you doing? I'm I'm checking for dry down because once they dry, the they're you have to make sure the print you're getting is going to look as good dry as it does wet. They look very seductive when they're dripping wet. Let me tell you. And so um, then then he'd be ready for the day, and then he'd work and go back in the darkroom and work until noon. Then we'd all have lunch at the table with Virginia. It was the darkroom assistant, me, and the lady that was spotting prints. And we'd all sit down and have a nice lunch together. And then he'd always go downtown. He did take a little nap um, from one to two. He'd lie down and, and maybe read or relax. And then he'd come back up and then he'd work at his typewriter in the afternoon. He was always typing letters to, if you didn't send a letter every day or preferably more than one or, or make a call about the environment, you hadn't achieved anything. And he'd do that till the afternoon. And then promptly at five o'clock, it was time for drinks. And then anybody in the world could call up and make an appointment to come and join him for cocktails. It, it was egalitarian. No, no, there was nobody snooty here. They'd come in and you could bring your portfolio and he'd lay it out on the floor and, and critique it for you. So that was his day. And, and he just loved his day. The happiest time was when he was in the dark room. I think it was kind of like his womb. He just loved being in there. He took, when I first arrived, he said, Oh, come in the dark room with me. I, I want to show you what I do. And meanwhile, I've just arrived and the orca whales are out and the uh, sea otters are in the blue Pacific I'm out the living room window. And I'm thinking, and the sun, and I'm thinking we're going in the dark room with the loud noise and the water and the chemicals smell terrible. And he closed the door and then you can't leave. You're, you're, you're stuck. And, and, and he's doing the shh, dodging and burning and the counting and the put the, and I'm thinking how, soon can I get out of here? And he opens the door and I ran out. I hated it, but he thought the dark room was absolutely a great place. Well, maybe we can continue talking about the dark room a little bit. Um, in your book, looking at Ansel Adams, the photographs and the men, you write quite elegant, elegantly about Ansel's difficulty with a negative for clearing winter storm. Can you speak to his evolving printing style over the years and give some clarity and background about the reasons for stylistic changes, such as increases of contrast leading to more drama in certain compositions? That's for you, Andrea. What's for me? Oh, sorry. I thought you asked David. I was watching, waiting for David's mouth. <laughs> Uh, let me see. Well, you know, Ansel, his first pictures were really pictorial. If you look at his early work from the 20s, it's very pictorial and soft. And in, in very, very early work, you're not sure whether it's an etching or a drawing or, a, or something, a charcoal sketch. But then um, with F64, David's group, the David formed a group, F F64 with sharpness, crisp depths of depth of field. Um, strong contrast. Uh, Ansel kind of discovered that in the early 30s, and 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 he was often away, and he and he his his pictures got bolder and bolder, not only in terms of composition, but in terms of print quality. So if the one you're looking at now is kind of soft, you know that could be a charcoal drawing, but actually it's a photograph. And um, in very short order, in the early starting in the early 1930s, he became went to this modernist style. And by the time he was, um, so here's Clearing Winter Storm. By the time he was in his 70s, he was still printing the same negative, but pr printing it differently. He was printing it with more force and contrast. 
and and it was uh, it was even more impressive. So the way I look at it is Ansel went from kind of soft and romantic to at the end he was a very very modern man and he always believed that as I said before that the print he made the day was better than the print yesterday. So it's one one thing for us to go look at the early ones and say they're beautiful. He would say, "Oh no, I can do better today." And I I I that's Ansel's positive side. So now I have another question for David. Um, when you build a collection that spans a photographer's full career, you have the unique opportunity to chart the development and the evolution of the artist's composition and printing styles. So how is seeing the earliest works like Panama Pacific Expo and Helmet Rock, both of which you acquired directly from the Adams family, influenced your appreciation of Ansel's more iconic images like Winter Sunrise Sierra Nevada from Lone Pine and Rose and Driftwood? Oh, I love Rose and Driftwood. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, you know, so what Andrew was you know talking about, you you kind of also need to understand what was happening in photography at the time. And so so when Angel was about eight in eighteen, so you know nineteen twenty, the the general consensus was in photography that it was this uh, soft focus, this you know charcoal uh, uh, drawing looking like photograph. So that was kind of the uh, uh, photograph uh, du jour that, that, that all the photographers during that time uh, were aiming towards. So as, as Angel matured, you could really see um, how, how that really changed. And then he came up with his own identity with his pre-visualization and then his zone system. Uh, the zone system is a way just from, it has as 11, uh, 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 gradations of black so you know pure black and pure white and, and so he could he could um uh predictably come up with through the processing uh and the uh, uh the the processing procedure and also taking pictures so he could then control this and come up with later on what the f64 club calls straight photography and that is more of just just the 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 uh, you know yosemite valley is beautiful as it is. Let's just capture it and really uh, uh, tone it up a little bit, and 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 uh, you know present it in a way that it is exactly what you see, you think. But he's he's actually done a few things to it that 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 you know make it more contrasty. And it's not. He actually says it, it would be it would be a shame to only use a number twenty six red right and filter um, to all your photographs to make them stand out and what a number six twenty six red rat filter does is it just makes a picture really contrasty. So so he was really trying to not only do that but do other things which was the 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 breadth of the artist which is what I tried to collect so you could see it from from you know from uh, nineteen sixteen all the way through through you know nineteen eighty four. So so uh, and Andrew Smith was was a big part of that helping me to uh, curate that and, and come up with that. But again, when I was doing it, I didn't feel like a collector. I really just felt like I was collecting all these different images and at different times of his life, they meant different things. Of, of course, the very early stuff is very valuable and very rare. So I was really fortunate to get some of that early uh, uh, work from, from in Andrea helped help me with a lot of that as well. So, um, but you know, everybody asks me, what's your favorite picture? You know, I'm going to say the Mona left the face half dome, but the Mona Lisa one is probably the best one I've got. But I, I like them all. You know, now, now to be honest, I like some more than others, but like, you know, the Rose and Driftwood, wow. I mean, let's put that one up again. That one's everybody I talked to about that. They love that one. They love that one. I love that one. Well, so. what about, I mean, every, all the photographs that we've been uh, talking about for the most part um, are, especially the early work, um, are sort of a smaller scale, but Ansel's images resonate from the smallest to the largest scale. And there, of course, we have this beautiful print of uh, Rose and Driftwood. Uh, there are, however, several monumental mural sized uh, prints in your collection, David. Uh, do you think that bigger is always better? 
Well, I'm going to answer that with yes and no, because they're just stunning. I mean, who doesn't want like a giant picture when you walk in? I mean, that's awesome. Now, the, the, the you know, rosewood and dri the rose and driftwood it is it's a relatively small photograph. Everybody comments on that one, how, how beautiful it is. So the beauty, you know, it's it, it's in the it's in the eyes of the beholder. I like them all because I like the smaller ones, but the big ones sure do pop and they're awesome. He, he kind of had an affinity kind of the middle to the, the light of his life as Andrea kind of discusses it with the, with the bigger ones. And, and they're just, they're just majestic. Who wouldn't want that, you know, right as you come in the entry of your home or your office, you've got a, a, a you know, vertical uh, Aspen as we're, as we're showing there. So it's just, they're just, or the, uh, uh, yeah, the gravel bars of uh, California. I mean, they're just to, to look at them on screen is one thing, but to be standing there with them, um, is just awesome. And that one right there is actually in three pieces. It's so big. Um, that one's that, that one is so big. I had to have a crane come up to my office in Midland and take it out, take a window out and take it out that way. Uh, so, I mean, it's just, it's, but it's stunning. Who would not you know want that in their office or their lobby? Well, and, and in an earlier conversation that we were having, Andrea pointed out that mural printing was something that Adams was quite passionate about starting in the 1930s uh, and wrote about extensively, um, as he did with all technical innovations. Um, and so you do see uh, his work in every scale. And because he was such a technically proficient photographer, both behind the camera and in the darkroom, there... There is no scale of a large or small that is not fully evocative um, when you're looking at a great Ansel Adams photograph. So, Andrea, I have a, a question about a specific uh, work in the collection that I don't get to see very often or don't get to see in this context. Silverton, Colorado stands out uh, to me in David's collection. Given its large scale, it's 30 by 40 inches. Um, it's an image that was clearly important to Ansel, uh, but that you seldom see outside of the portfolio edition. Can you speak to the image or Adam's sequencing of it within the within the portfolio? Well, it's a picture that there aren't many. Well, actually, there are 100 prints in the portfolio, but I'm not sure there are just a handful maybe besides that except for this this huge one that david has which is just spectacular and it's the rockies behind the little buildings here um and i remember whenever time we did a a book the publisher was always saying let's have we need some pictures of the rockies you've got nothing but the sierra here what about the rockies and and Ansel, I asked Ansel about that. He said, oh my God, the Rockies are just so boring to photograph. There's just there's no shape to them. And I said, what do you mean? He said, think of the Sierra. It's like little sculptures in granite. The Rockies just a giant massif. And so here he was passing through Colorado and he took this photograph. And because of the, uh, the uh, mountain is so boring, what he's done is create little, little Sierra sculptures in the foreground by using the little peaked roofs. And so he's taken what's a very uninteresting piece of landscape behind, and he's actually animated it with these little houses in the foreground with these little peaked roofs and the careful light coming through the, the, um, the slats of the fence and the way he just lets the little windows in the little buildings peek right over the, the, uh, the top of the, the fence and notice the careful cropping left and right with the shadows and the, the di diagonals. Every, every part of a photograph was important to Ansel. Look how just the top, the peak is just, just enough down below that you can you see a little sky above the top of the top of the mountain. When he set up, it was stand, stood at the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the, the big thing he was trimming, the paper trimmer, he would be whacking it off on either sides and then he'd look at it and he, he was very, very careful. And whenever people brought their photographs to him to critique, he'd say, you know, you've got to be more careful in your edges. He, 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 there was no part of the photograph that didn't escape him. The other thing I really love about this picture is it goes from this kind of pale gray mountain peak in the back to this really wonderful, severe black and white in the foreground. And Ansel used to liken 
uh, he, he was trained as a concert pianist, so he often came up with musical analogies. And he would say, when you're making a photograph, you want to play all 88 keys of, it's like uh, the piano, you want to play all 88 keys. So you want to include everything, as David talked, from black to white. You want to include every shade from black to white so that you have a really rich palette. And this photograph, it's just the, an oddball combination, and I, I think it's just, I, I just, I just love it. I love this feeling of light, and Ansel was all about light. Well, we're in agreement there, then. Uh, so, Andrea, um, I, I shared one of my, my favorites um, for you. Are your favorite photographs influenced by understanding um, Ansel's darkroom? process or your experiences you had with them or is it just a visceral reaction? It's a visceral reaction. I really don't know much about the darkroom. David starts talking about the number 42 rat and filter and I'm thinking well I've heard that, I've heard about that. I have no idea what that does. I, I just look at the finished product and I, I really don't think anybody should have to know what goes on in, in, in the making of the photograph. They should just appreciate the finished work of art and it should speak to your heart and your soul and Ansel's photographs do. The first first box when his show arrived at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1974 to hang on the walls, the very first photograph out of the box was Clearing Winter Storm. And I still remember standing in front of it in the gallery thinking, wow, I've never seen anything like this before. This is absolutely incredible. And I'd seen a lot of great photographs at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, let me tell you. But there was something about that his print and the presentation and standing there, uh, I will, I, I will never, I get chills just thinking about it. So, a good photograph will do that to you. So, this question is going to uh, be one of our last before we get to uh, the audience, and I think it is a good question to end on uh, potentially. What do you, with all of your vast experience, either knowing Adams or studying him or collecting him, what do you attribute to Ansel's enduring appeal? Why would you say that Ansel is the most important American photographer of the 20th century? Is this for me or is this David? I, I want to hear both perspectives, actually. So, Go David, ahead. what do you think? What? Me? David, why don't we ask oh, you? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, you know, it's the it's the visceral reaction that you're talking about. Everyone loves nature. Everyone likes to be outdoors, regardless what it is you like to do outdoors. So, outdoors always speaks to man, and just his uh, expertise of capturing that image, um, just. I think speaks to mankind. I think it speaks to everyone. And I do know this, there's uh, some of his Aspen work, his, his vertical Aspen and his horizontal Aspen. I, I'm a backpacker. So I go up and I backpack up in the mountain and you know camp in a tent and have a campfire and, and catch fish and, and all that. And I walk by a lot of these images just with my buddies with my backpack on and even though they really speak to me when I'm there and I, and, I, and I like it, I can tell the way that Angel captures it, makes it look even better on a, uh, a piece of paper on your wall than it actually does in person. Because he just brings out the, the, the contrast or the details of it. So I can't see how anyone could ever refute uh, his, his, his lovely, images of capturing not only nature but really the american west mm -hmm. and that is always have a, the american west has a, a a special place i think in everyone's heart around the world absolutely and uh andrea what about you i absolutely agree i always when they ever they show the picture of winter sunrise one of the horse in the foreground and the white peaks i always see the words America the beautiful right above the white peaks and it's it's as if Ansel's telling us this is what you have to to have and hold you know from this day forward you you've got to take care of the of what of what you have this is the the magical part of America so 
Well, and, and there is, uh, there's Ansel Adams, self-portrait, Monument Valley, um, a, a later self-portrait, but certainly that is a photographer, self-assured, in complete control of his craft. Um, and it is, really gives to me a lot of, a lot of emotion and self-confidence. Um, so uh, this has been fantastic so far, and I hate to cut us off from our own conversation, but want to make sure we get to our audience questions. I think this is a good time to pause and take those questions. So as a reminder, you can type your questions into the web form under this video at any time. We will read them and uh, say them aloud. So Amy, I think you got the first one. Yes, so this is a question for Andrea. So as someone who worked closely with Ansel throughout his career, how did you see his work impact and inspire environmental activism? Oh my gosh, well Ansel was synonymous. Even I as a high school girl remember when there was a story in the New York Times about a giant battle with the Sierra Club. And it was Ansel's group versus Dave, uh, uh, what was his name, Dave something or the group for, for the control of the Sierra Club. And, and from, the, from an early age, Ansel had been instrumental in the Sierra Club and battling to keep America's wild places wild. And as I said before, he, he felt you had to do, do this on a day, literally daily basis. And so, um, um, so he, he oh, 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 here, here, I've forgotten what this question was, wait a second. Well, it's just um, a question about, about his efforts to inspire um, and activate well, uh, he, environmental. Yes, he just wanted everybody to get in there and fight. And and he he wrote a letter to the editor almost every day and his letters were, and they people responded to his letters. And he he lobbied President Carter in what, we went to Washington and Ansel lobbied Carter for the Alaska Wild Lands Bill to, to pass the Wilderness Bill. And he, 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 was, he was not shy. He, he wanted, he went to go against his better, um, better judgment, he went to meet with Ronald Reagan to try and convince him that the wilderness was important in America and America's wild places in the national parks. I don't think he was successful, but he decided, I'm gonna give it a try. And he, so he, he was really brave. Ansel was not shy in any part of, uh, of his life, certainly not in his photographs um, or in his um, conservation efforts. So it looks like we've got um, another great question, David. This is from the audience. If I was able to purchase only one Ansel Adams image to be representative in my small collection, which image would you recommend? Well, I was actually talking to somebody about that yesterday and they had intimated that they were gonna sell a kidney to buy one. <laughs> so um, that seemed a little bit drastic. However, if you're not gonna sell a kidney, then, um, you know, I would really, um, I would go, so here's what I would do. I would go through the catalog. I would just uh, uh, mark the ones that, that, that have, have, have that visceral effect and you can't mark them all. I mean, I'd mark them all, but then, but then I'd weed them down to about six or seven if you're only gonna buy one and it's a small collection. Um, but just cause it's a small collection, you don't have to think small, you can think big so you need to really think about what you would want to do with that. And, and, and I would buy the one that is your prize because this 123 pictures that I'm, I'm putting in this auction, every single one of these of my 650 that I own, every one of these is a prize. So you won't go wrong on buying any of these, but I would buy the, but the, cause the, these are, these are all probably the best quality photographs of Ansel Iconic that have ever come to market. Um, so I, our I, best I, advice is always to buy what you love. Absolutely. Buy, buy what you love, but dig deep. But dig deep. <laughs> um, Amy, I think we've yeah, got another. So we have another question and it could be for either of you. Um, it's a question about Ansel's letters to his friends like George O'Keefe and Edward Weston. We um, know that he was a prolific letter writer. So what aspects about him as an artist are revealed through these letters? 
well, I've actually read a lot of the letters. I actually own a, a lot of his correspondence. And I know Andrew, I'll let Andrew speak to this, but, but sort of the takeaway, cause, cause that's a great question. Cause I was always wondering that he is, he is tirelessly working on the craft, tirelessly working on with Kodak, new paper, new ways to do it. Everybody always asks me, would he have embraced digital photography in the, and it's, it's yes, he would have. He actually talks in some correspondence that I have about electronic photographs. And I think that was in the seventies. He wrote about that. So he is, he is tirelessly, he loves his art and he's talking about something he loves. So he's wanting to make it better and to, to talk about it and enjoy it. If you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Beautifully put. Yep. So what about you, Andrea? I know you oh, dealt with that Ansel, a lot. And Ansel always said, when you're looking at photographs, close your eyes and which one can you bring to mind without seeing it? What has stuck in your mind's eye? And to me, that's the one that resonates with you. So for instance, in David's collection, there are two pictures that I'm dying to buy. I'm a little old lady on a fixed income, right? I, I do not need to spend thousands of them. There are two I cannot, I'm not going to tell you which two they are. <laughs> but they're, they're oddball, but, but because they're so oddball with a strange light in the background and one's just two and a quarter by three and a quarter, I mean, this is nuts, right? And I can't get those two out of my mind and I just may have to bid. But I'm not telling you which two they are. Anyway, you, you, the, it has to speak to your heart. The photograph has to speak to your heart, your heart and your soul. Absolutely. And I think we've got time for one last question. Um, if we can end on this, um, if we know, uh, what was Ansel's favorite from his body of work? That's going to be for Andrea. <laughs> well, now, David, this is an interesting question. It, it would for Ansel, it would be like choosing among your children. <laughs> he, he he wouldn't be able to choose. He he would always say whatever was the one he was worked on was the favorite at the moment. However, I have to tell you, when you walked into his house, what was the biggest, most showy show showy in a good way photograph hanging up? It was an enormous monolith, a really enormous, and it still hangs there in Mike and Jean's house. I'm sure they will never part with this photograph. Or it should go to a museum someday if it goes anywhere. And uh, it, it just gigantic, glossy, and is absolutely staggeringly beautiful. So in a way, you could argue that that was the biggest photograph in his house. Um, and and I uh, and I I do think he had a sweet spot for that day. The, the memories of that day going up in the snow and 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 the, and the first visualization, as you said, right. David. But so maybe Ansel's favorite photograph, um, if we are going to be so bold to say it is monolith, is also David's favorite photograph, which is a wonderful way to bring this full circle. Um, we are have tons of questions that we haven't gotten to. We will take note of those questions and be in touch and send, um, send replies. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, because we want to uh, give you all the information that you need, that's all the time that we have for questions today. Um, many thanks to our wonderful participants. Many thanks to David and to Andrea and to my co-host, um, Amy, who I will see back down in the department soon. And for all of you for tuning in. As a reminder, the auction, A Grand Vision, the David H. Arrington collection is on Monday, December 14th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. We have just opened our exhibition which you can see here, and are open uh, by appointment or virtually by FaceTime. So ask questions, and above all, remember to register to bid. Thank you guys so much.